Today on Beerus TV Investigates, we're gonna take a look at how the Beerus 160 is doing two and a half months after stopping doing water changes and going Triton. Hi, Ryan, your host of Beerus TV Investigates, a weekly YouTube series which explores popular reefing theories, products, methods, what the manuals are missing with a focus on putting them to the test. Over the last year, we've been testing various refugium options and found that refugiums can be much more effective than we would have ever thought they could be. This episode is all about what happens when we apply what we've learned with the experiments to a real reef tank. Two and a half months ago, we decided to make a big bet on those experiment results and not just expand the refugium on the BRS-160 and make it the primary method of nutrient reduction, but also remove all the other nutrient export methods other than the skimmer. And yes, that means no more water changes for nutrient reduction as well. So this week, we're going to talk a bit about why we would do something as insane as stopping water changes, talk about how that changeover is going, and then share some solid advice Victor over at Worldwide Coral shared with me that I think is certainly applicable to our experience here. Starting with why we made that change. When the results from our refugium test started to come back, they pretty clearly demonstrated if we put real effort into making a productive refugium, it produced very real results. By selecting a light with the correct spectrum peaks and intensity designed to drive rapid photosynthesis rates and related nutrient uptake, we're able to not just maintain ultra low nutrient levels, but also avoid algae growth in the display despite daily nitrogen and phosphorus additions via food and no water changes or skimmers to remove them in these experiments. Here at the shop, we generate a lot of discussion about what water changes are for, why we do them, are they effective at those goals, and even though everyone here thought we should continue doing them because it's part of the DNA of reefing, I think it's really time to ask if everything that we've learned in the last decade and our modern styles of reef keeping has evolved past the dilution method of water changes. If you take a moment and really ask ourselves why we do those water changes, I think a lot of us are going to be really hard pressed to have a solid reason other than it's what we're used to. End of the day, water changes and dilution are not only the most inefficient way to reduce or add anything to the tank, but it's also the hardest and amongst the most expensive. So attempting to look at this with an open mind, in the end, I really only see three main reasons to perform a water change, remove undesirable nutrients from the tank, replace major, minor, and trace elements, and then remove general contaminants. Looking first at nutrient reduction, between methods like Zeovit, carbon dosing like vodka, vinegar, bio pellets, and Red Seas, NO3, PO4X, algae scrubbers, and refugiums, exporting nutrients from the tank has really become a non-issue. Anyone implementing any of these modern reef keeping methods just don't have an issue with nitrate or phosphate in the tank. So if you already have near zero nitrate and phosphate in the tank, it just makes no sense to try and dilute zero with zero because it's still zero. Water changes are simply not needed for nutrient control with today's common reefing methods. Now looking at major, minor, and trace elements, almost everyone has a method for replacing major elements like calcium and alkalinity, as well as testing for them to know that it's working. Minor and trace elements are a bit different, and historically, the main offerings were replacing minor and trace elements with water changes, two parts which include limited trace elements, magic trace element elixirs, and presumably trace elements added via calcium reactor media. Major issue here is if I let the trace element levels drop to 70% of the natural seawater levels and I do a 20% change with a solid salt mix, I've only raised the level 6 points to 76% and the levels will continue to seesaw down until it finds equilibrium with your water change schedule, but it will always be depleted. We can try and raise them using trace element elixirs, however this is more of a hope and pray approach because most of them don't tell us what's in them and historically we've had no method to test or know what the mineral or trace element levels were in our tanks. So it's just to pour the trace element elixir in and hope that what you're doing was right, which is really a pretty insane approach. So now looking at modern approaches to these minor and trace elements and what reefers are actually doing today. Red Sea has separated the trace elements out into four different solutions, which allows you to maintain more elements without precipitation issues, and how much of these trace element solutions that you dose to the tank is directly tied to the amount of calcium your tank consumes. Tying the addition of trace elements to the calcium uptake is a much more intelligent way to approach this. Triton also takes a similar approach with their four-part Core 7 dosing solution, which is also designed to replace these elements as they're consumed in an average reef tank and in relation to the calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium consumption. 
However, the most important component here is we no longer have to just trust what they're saying is accurate. And the hobby now has dramatically increased our ability to test for these elements with ICP testing by companies like Triton. We have the ability to test for a wide array of elements and deeper insight into the chemistry in our tanks than ever before. We now have the ability to confirm our approach is working and a million miles from that magic trace element elixir approach. Now ICP testing is not a perfect solution on all elements and it is more accurate on some than others. Some reefers might get hung up on this, but this type of testing represents a huge advancement in reefing because this data is infinitely more valuable than the hope and pray approach with very limited vision into the actual chemistry of the tank. In this world, if we're off on a single element like zinc, we don't have to dump in a trace element elixir to raise zinc and everything else along with it. There are now options out there that allow us to only dose zinc. All of this is with the design to match natural seawater, because if there's one thing that we know produces results, it is natural seawater. So end of the day, if I'm using a major, minor, and trace element replenishment system designed to maintain all of these near natural seawater parameters, and I'm getting ICP testing reports every few months that say I'm on track to that goal, I just can't imagine why anyone would want to do a water change to try and improve on chemistry which already matches natural seawater parameters. And the last reason to do water changes is general contaminants which come from air, finger, foods, and additives. This is an unknown in all of this. We use activated carbon to remove a wide variety of contaminants from the tank, starting with colored pigments and odors. But the type of carbon that most reefers are using today, like ROX 0.8, is a blend of a variety of different carbons with a wide variety of pore sizes and capable of efficiently removing a wide array of contaminants. Supportive of that, ICP testing is also going to likely tell you if a piece of equipment is rusting in the tank, pipes in the basement ceiling are dripping into the tank, or if one of our kids drops some pennies into the tank. We'll know that something is wrong and be able to go hunting for it before the tank levels rise to a point of distressing the tank inhabitants or even worse. So in the end, if nitrate and phosphate are undetectable, all my chemistry matches natural seawater, and I have a decent window into identifying general contaminants as well as a solid carbon which removes many more difficult to detect contaminants, I just can't really come up with a reason as to why I'm hauling all these buckets of water around. I know it goes against all the reefing community's DNA to stop doing water changes, but if I can't come up with a solid reason for doing all that work, I think I at least have to try to see what happens if we remove seemingly unimportant, time-consuming, and expensive components of our maintenance schedule. This is really what BRSTV Investigates is all about, learning something and then trying it and exploring it so you don't have to use your tanks as the test tanks. In that spirit, just because this all seems very plausible and I'm about to share so far is going really well, I would encourage reefers to take advantage of what we're doing here and see what the long-term outcome is before making changes to your own systems. So just because it sounds plausible doesn't always make it real, and I think the nine month to one year mark will give a pretty solid window into how this is going and only get more accurate from there on out. So wait and see how this evolves before trying it on your own tank. One thing I will mention is water changes are still a tool in the reefer's box, but rather than using them blindly, we can use them when our testing tells us something undesirable is elevated or simply because a tank is showing signs of distress with an unidentifiable cause. My knee-jerk solution anytime things look bad is to change out the carbon, which is a tool. Similar to that, we can use water changes as a tool. If the carbon doesn't work and the corals are still showing signs of distress, I often do a series of three to four 30% water changes a few days apart designed to almost completely change over the water. Keep in mind, with a single 30% change, 70% of what you're concerned about is still in there. So again, a water change can be an awesome tool to an actual issue, but I'm obviously questioning why we would do them without an actual reason. So in that spirit, we changed over the Triton method two and a half months ago and stopped doing those maintenance water changes. I will share that I loaned that phrase, modern reef keeping from Triton CEO at last year's MACNA presentation where we focused on a presentation of taking everything that modern reef keepers are currently doing with the focus on three primary pillars of reefing, filtration, chemistry, and lighting. If you get those three things right, the net result is proper biology and a healthy, thriving reef tank. 
Even though this experiment was predominantly about using a refugium to remove nutrients in a live reef tank, it made sense to move to the Triton method because the Core 7 Triton solution is directly designed to be a chemistry solution that works with our primary method of nutrient filtration, a refugium, and eliminating water changes and the dilution approach from our filtration. Coupled with our T5 LED hybrid approach to lighting, I think this will have all the important components to produce healthy biology. So I'm sure all of you are wondering how the changeover went. I can tell you right now that the changeover absolutely had some initial negative results. I'm going to get to this a bit later when I share what Victor at Worldwide Coral shared with me. But end of story, corals and reef tanks like stability and zero changes to their environment. Most people will also tell you that shifting away from Zeovit can be a challenge as well. Reef tanks do not have positive reactions to large changes in filtration. In this case, we stop carbon dosing, remove the Zeovit media, stop dosing most of the KZ products, remove the roller mat, change the light on the refugium, enlarge the fuge, increase the tank turnover by almost double, and had significant fluctuations in alkalinity when we moved from BRS two part to the new Triton four part, which has a much smaller dose. Net result of that was most of the zoanthids all closed up, the acans lost some heads, hydnophora lost some tissue, the duncan shrunk up, and most of the LPS corals generally just didn't look happy for four to six weeks while the tank stabilized around the new filtration and system design changes. We didn't lose any corals entirely, and the SPS seemed to be okay with just a few corals browning out during that time. Overall, you could call this a negative change, but with this many elements of the system changing all in a single day, that was almost a foregone conclusion and should be the expectation. The best thing we can do with our reef tanks is leave them alone and keep doing what's producing results. The only reason to change anything is because what you're doing either isn't working or there's a very definable change or advantage that you'd like to achieve. In this case, removing water changes would be the one I think a lot of people would consider to be a real motivation. So all that noted, corals are very adaptive animals and given a bit of time will adapt to a wide array of environments. Fast forward to 10 weeks and today there's an entirely different set of results. Everything is happy and adjusted to the stable system changes. The few SPS that browned out are regaining their color, some with even better color, and everything is open again. There are two or three holdouts, but overall, if you look around the tank, you'll see the tank and the corals look very healthy. And if you didn't know any better, you would say there was no noticeable change from what we were doing before, which is about the best you can hope for at 10 weeks after a change like this. I will share some of the most notable components related to the change. First, even though we feed two cubes of mysis, two cubes of calanus, two cubes of cyclopods, reef chili, Hikari Extreme algae pellets, and a couple of amino acid products from KZ every single day, we still have zero nitrate, zero phosphate, and zero algae in the display in a zero water change environment. We have not found an endpoint where the refugium isn't capable of proper filtration and removing all of the excess nitrate and phosphate from the tank. This is a ridiculous amount of food that I would never recommend to anyone, an almost certain assurance of an algae and nutrient-ridden failure for anyone who did feed that much. We're intentionally pushing the limit so everyone can get an idea of what is possible with a properly lit and designed refugium. And while most reefers would refer to zero nitrate and zero phosphate as an ultra-low nutrient tank, I think this tank is far from ultra-low nutrients. Similar to the ocean where nitrate and phosphate is scarce and almost undetectable, the ocean currents still have an almost infinite amount of nutrients, which makes it almost constantly available. So with all this food input, nutrients in the 160 are also almost constantly available in a wide variety of forms ranging from prey-like particles, potential food for live prey, as well as broken down into amino acids and carbohydrates. All these nutritional elements further broken down throughout the day, so there's a continual source of nitrate and phosphate, but undesirable buildup or excess is removed by the refugium and proper filtration at night. So in terms of chemistry, we did a handful of larger water changes at the beginning to get back to ground zero using Red Sea's blue bucket salt, which has all the major element parameters near what we were looking for. Testing with Triton's ICP testing, we found the salt to be pretty spot on. The initial results had higher than desired silica and low iodine levels, which I think is a pretty solid starting point. Fast forward a month and the silica is back in line and everything is in the green except iodine. And they said phosphate is also in the parts per billion and a bit too low. So one month after that, on the 10th of October, we're seeing marginal lithium and manganese increases, and iodine is again very low. 
Net result of this is we've corrected the iodine level each time after the results, but we may have to incorporate a semi-frequent dose to keep it on track. It's pretty common to see marginal lithium levels in a reef tank, so we'll keep an eye on that as well as the manganese. If they become issues, we'll look into the potential causes and solutions now that we know there exist. We've also independently tracked nitrate and phosphate levels throughout this and found near zero readings the entire time despite our heavy feedings. So the net result is after two and a half months of zero water changes is a visually healthy tank where I think the filtration is working as intended chemistry is on track and we have a solid lighting solution producing desirable biology. So far I'd call this a success but I'd absolutely follow along with us and I'd expect to see updates every 90 days or so. I do have a handful of smaller notes related to this changeover. We were dosing 150 milliliters a day of BRS 2 part. Prior to the changeover, now we dose 40 milliliters a day of the Triton Core 7 because it's more concentrated. So I'd expect to use about a fourth as much solution, but results may vary. I'll also note that just like the corals or any other photosynthetic organism in the tank, the Catomorpha also appreciates stability. The Cato didn't like the light changeover from the H380 to the H1200 initially and took four to six weeks to adjust and visually take off. It was reducing nutrients that whole time, but visually wasn't growing much. Now it's in a rapid growth mode. Also note that we have the H1200 set to the gross setting with more blue spectrum as well as at the lowest intensity can possibly go. This is really a solid lighting option for something really big like maybe a four foot cube or horse trough. Almost none of you would need something like this for a standard fuge. Just to give you a reference point, it's on its lowest setting which draws only 95 watts which is just five watts more than the 90 of the H380 so probably not producing dramatically different results. I also think that while well, most of my tanks probably run around five times turnover through the sump after head pressure is calculated, I think Triton's recommendation of a real 10x turnover is part of why the refugium filtration works so well, keeping the unwanted nutrients flowing through the filter. I know it's an unrealistic option for most people, but the Abyss DC return pump does live up the expectations of both quality and silent operations. Coupled with the Neptune flow meters, there's vision into how well this is working that goes way beyond what I've ever seen before. I'll also say, well, I did find the Neptune dose containers to be a bit smaller than I would have used for two part before. With the Triton method and using only about 25% of the solution, I think they're actually a solid size. And again, not the cheapest, but the integrated sensors that tell me when the containers are empty and need to be refilled is actually pretty nice. The last bit I want to share with you is based on a conversation I had with Victor over at Worldwide Corals at the last Reef of Palooza. We talked a lot about stability and the importance of not changing anything to produce the best success. This kind of goes against the natural desire many of us have to continually tweak things. I will say almost all the best tanks out there, particularly those wall-to-wall -wall SPS tanks, which have insane color, have one thing in common, ultra-stable parameters and systems. To that note, I asked Victor how the radions were going for this large propagation facility, and he said, awesome. The reason I asked is because not every reefer has had success with LEDs, and I value his particular experience because his livelihood is directly impacted by the coloration and growth rate of the corals. More or less, this is what he had to say. The reason why we've all had successes with halides and T5s before was because you plug them in, and for the most part, people are going to leave them alone. The light may actually be far from ideal for the particular coral, but these are amazingly adaptive animals and will acclimate to a wide variety of environments, provided you leave them alone. So it's not that the halides and T5s are necessarily better in all fronts, it's just that you're not going to mess with them after you plug them in. With LEDs, the nature of having all those switches begs you to play with them constantly. Then things don't look good, so you adjust. They look worse, and you adjust again. All these features, desire to use them, and related lack of stability is likely one of the number one causes of why many reefers have issues with LEDs. It may not be the light itself. In the end, I have to completely agree. There are some general intensity guidelines to stay within or near, and knowledge on spread and avoiding shadowing is helpful, but the number one component of an amazingly successful reef tank is stability. 
So we're not talking directly about lighting today. I thought it was relevant to today's conversation because the issues that we experienced when changing over the filtration methods and how the tank reacted to a major stability change. We essentially have a mini life support system in our homes for these animals and their health is directly related to a stable environment. In our videos, the goal is substantially different than our display tanks at home. With BRS TV, the goal is to show you the results of using various methods and pieces of gear, which means we have to constantly change things. But at home, I would do my research and pick a solution and implement or work slowly towards it. Stability at home is king. One of the things that we're exploring here is trying a variety of different water changeless modern reef keeping methods outside of Triton, following from setup to multi-year results. This is a huge resource and time investment, so let us know if this is something that you would like to see us do. I haven't got it approved yet, and your feedback is absolutely what makes that happen. If you have any additional questions about how our changeover to Triton went, or even better, want to share your experiences with the community, check out our thread over on Reef to Reef. Reef to Reef has really become the forefront of everything good happening in reefing, and I'm really enjoying the conversations about everything that we cover here on BRS TV. And don't forget, we're giving away H380 and some Triton gear, so hit that link that just showed up, or head on over to the site, click on specials and deals, then free stuff to sign up. As always, if you like what we're doing here, give us a quick thumbs up and let us know. And subscribe because we release new reefing videos all week long. See you next Friday with another BRS TV Investigates.